I'm Kenny Eight. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message, and today we're starting a brand new series entitled The End Time Church. This message, this first message, is entitled The Church of Laodicea. The book of Revelation was written by John, the apostle of Jesus, while exiled on the Isle of Patmos off the coast of modern day Turkey. The book of Revelation is made up of seven letters that were sent to the seven churches of Asia, along with several visions of the future given to John by Jesus and then told to write what he sees. But at any rate, the book starts with John in the spirit on the Lord's day. And then Jesus shows up and gives him a word and a revelation of what must take place, not just take place, but what must soon take place. I'm under the belief that those days that John prophesied about, those days that John wrote about are upon us right now. Over 2,000 years ago, John was told he saw these days. These days are now. We're living in those days, I believe. Turn with me, please, to our scripture found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 22. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom i love i reprove and discipline and so be zealous and repent behold i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There were seven churches listed that John was to write to. They were one. The church in Ephesus. Two, the church in Smyrna. The church in Pergamum. The church in Thyatira. The church in Sardis. The church in Philadelphia. The church in Laodicea. The very last church listed is Laodicea. I believe those churches were real churches existed in the time of John when he wrote the book of Revelation. They each had their own unique problems. But I also believe they represent the seven church ages, exhibiting the same unique problems. In that case, Laodicea, being the very last church listed, would represent the end time church, which would be us. We are that end time church. Look at what Jesus tells the sixth church, the church of Philadelphia. Turn with me, please. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, I want you to skip on down to verse 10. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth to try those who dwell on the earth. Did you notice that? Did you notice that Jesus said that he will keep them 
from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole earth. What hour of trial is that? That is the great tribulation. And why does he keep them from this hour of trial? Because of their patient endurance. It is the weakness of the church that brings on the great tribulation. So do you suppose that we will keep be kept from what we ourselves has caused to come about by our pride, by our prayerlessness, by our lack of holiness, by our alliance with darkness. We have become lovers of self rather than lovers of God, a proud and stiff-necked people who love to tickle ears and to have our own ears tickled. We fool ourselves when we think that we're so holy because we have hundreds of thousands of adoring fans. We're sitting in beautiful, expensive buildings, sitting in soft, beautiful pews and sipping our lattes. But Jesus said that we are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And he counsels us to buy from him gold refined by fire so that we may be rich and white garments so that we may clothe ourselves that the shame of our nakedness may not be seen. He also counsels us to buy salve to anoint our eyes so that we may see. This last day church is not all that we have cracked it up to be. What Jesus said to the Pharisees and the scribes can also be applied to us in these last days. Matthew chapter 15 verse 8. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The Father is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Not just with our lips, but in spirit and in truth. He wants our heart. He wants everything that's in us. He wants us to put our best forward and to love him with all that is within us. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. At the time of this writing, apparently, John and the other believers were going through some type of tribulations themselves. Because John just mentioned it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. They were experiencing tribulation, but not the great tribulation. A time like never before and will never be again, according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. Something greater than what they were experiencing was coming. But John said he was a partner with them in what? In patient endurance. So that is the reason why Jesus kept them from the great tribulation, their patient endurance. The church of Philadelphia represented the church age just before the last church age. The church just before the great tribulation, who will go through the great tribulation. The 18th and 19th century saw great men who loved the Lord. And they were very pious men. Men like Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, and his brother Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, Charles Spurgeon, Carl Barth, C.S. Lewis, and many others. These men were known for their piety. They were known for their theology, but not really known for signs and wonders and miracles as much. In other words, they had little power because Paul said, the kingdom of God is not about words, it's about power. And they did not have a lot of power. Sure, they experienced some miracles, but that is not what they were known for. Not like Peter, not like Paul and the first century church. Then along comes the church of Laodicea. To whom Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, So because you are lukewarm 
and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus says that we are neither hot nor cold. Think about that for a moment. Does that not describe the church age that we are now living in? Neither hot nor cold. It is difficult to get the church to worship if there's a football game going on. When the Super Bowl plays, we have to cancel church because nobody shows up because everybody wants to go and watch Super Bowl. I heard a testimony of a Hezbollah fighter who was such a devoted, dedicated Muslim that he read the Quran once every 10 days from cover to cover. We can hardly get a Christian to read one chapter a day, much less read from cover to cover in 10 days, or even six months, or even a year. How many Christians has even read the Bible cover to cover just one time, just once? He would not only read cover to cover, but meditate deeply on what he had read. The church is too busy watching what celebrities are doing and how they live their luxurious lives to take time to meditate on God's word. Not only that, he prayed five times a day. Being a Shiite Muslim, he was only required three times a day, but he prayed five times a day and sometimes even more. He fasted often because he wanted to spend even more time with his God. Christians are not known for our prayer life. We're not known for fasting. Matter of fact, it's a difficult thing to get a Christian to fast with you. Not only that, his desire was to spread Islam. Christians will not share their faith. They don't share their faith with people next door, people they work with people in their own families, much less to travel around the world to tell their testimony because Christians are afraid to offend someone. We don't want to be offensive with our message. The message of life, we're afraid to offend someone with. This man, this Muslim man, he had gained great power from Islam and he was seeking even more power. He did fast after fast after fast and prayed and prayed and prayed because he wanted more and more of the Islamic power. Today, the biggest critics of any kind of power in the church, any kind of signs, any kind of wonders in the church, you know who it is? is the church. The church criticizes the church if we even think about getting a little bit of power. When Paul said the kingdom of God is not about talk, but it's about power. The church is the first to criticize you if you believe Jesus for anything more than salvation. You got salvation, that's enough for you. You don't need no more. But to make a long story short, one day while meditating in a prison cell, he met Jesus. He is now a pastor. Imagine a Hezbollah fighter, a man who participated in executions, who once persecuted the faith that he is now preaching. Think about that. How great, how merciful is our God. How great, how merciful is our Lord Jesus. See, while Christians stand off and shrink back from the deeper things of God, Muslims strive to go deeper in Islam. The church has never been richer. Our preachers and evangelists are walking around advertising Gucci and other name brands that I can't even pronounce. Now, please understand that I'm not against prosperity. The high priests was the equivalent of a multi-millionaire. 
Think about this. The whole of the Israelite community, the whole land of Israel was commanded to bring a tenth of everything that they received. And then the high priest was to get a 10% of that. And this wasn't just 10%. This was 10% of the best of the best of the best. No doubt God blesses his people. And I'm okay with that. I believe God's people should be blessed. And they should be blessed of the blessed. Blessed and highly favored. But what I am against is being paid by these name brands like Gucci and other name brands to wear advertising their clothes. And the ones to whom they're preaching to can't even afford the buttons on those clothes, much less the whole outfit. That is what I'm against. When your wealth outweighs your piety, then you have a problem. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all extremely rich, but they were devout men. They were men of God. Nowadays, our preachers and church leaders are walking billboards for name brand companies that actually hate Christianity because we don't believe in the same things that they believe in. We don't value the same things that they value. We don't champion the same things that they champion. We are indeed rich in finances, but we're poor in piety. Some of our celebrity pastors with mega platforms are partying with, uh, how should I say, the ungodly. Our mega church pastors Children are hanging out with God-hating celebrities. They're besties with them. They use the excuse that, well, Jesus did it. Jesus ate. Jesus drank. Jesus hung out with sinners. Credit. Credit. But what he did not do was leave them the way he found them. Everyone he hung out with was changed for the better. Matthew, the tax collector, who later became one of his apostles, wrote the book of Matthew, one of the first Gospels. Peter, who said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, in Luke chapter 5, verse 8, later healed the sick with just his shadow. He became a pious man. Zacchaeus, the notorious tax collector, said, Half my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone, I will restore it fourfold. Luke chapter 19, verse 7 through 10. This was after he ate with Jesus, after he hung out with Jesus for just a little bit one day. Mary Magdalene, whom Jesus cast seven demons out of in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, became a woman of God. James and John, who asked Jesus if he wanted them to call down fire from heaven and destroy the Samaritans who rejected him, Luke chapter 9, verse 54, later wrote about loving even those who hate you. The outcast woman at the well, she went back and evangelized her whole village after having one conversation with Jesus. And there are many, many other examples. Matter of fact, there was no one, not one person that you could point to that Jesus spent any amount of time with or hung out with who remained the same. Therefore, my brothers and sisters who insist on hanging out with the ungodly because they're celebrities claiming that that's who Jesus hung out with, well, that's all well and good. But if you're going to use Jesus' example Use his full example and change lives, not leave them as you find them. This is not a scuba dive in the Caribbean where you leave everything as you find it. Their motto is, take only pictures, leave only bubbles. That is not like that. This is life. This is eternity. The only people who did not change were the Pharisees, were the scribes were the religious people. And even some of those changed. Nicodemus, for one. But even then, when he went to eat with those people, people were still getting saved. 
like Luke chapter 7 verse 36 through 39 the woman who cried so much that she wet his feet with her tears and then dried his feet with her hair she was a changed woman with that encounter so again if you're going to use Jesus as the benchmark please use the benchmark thank you let me bring your attention back to the second to the last church age, the church in Philadelphia. Jesus told them that he would save them or keep them from the hour of trial that is coming. But to the church of Laodicea, Jesus says, you are lukewarm and because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, just a nasty lukewarm where you can't even tell sinner from saint, Christian from non-Christian, righteous from unrighteous. The church looks just like the world. The church acts just like the world. The church wants to be just like the world. Think about this for a moment. The church is so lukewarm that it has to dress like the world in order to win the world because no one will come to our services otherwise. How sad of a state is that? The world's all tatted up now. So what happens to the church? The church is all tatted up too. The church used to wear their Sunday best when they came out to worship their God. Now they wear their holy jeans. They wear shorts, flip-flops, and a sword because they can't attract the world. No, how else? If they dress too good, the world won't come. What are you? No wonder Jesus said we are lukewarm and he will spit us out of his mouth. What did he mean by that? That he will spit us out of his mouth. That is a reference to his protection. He will remove his protection from us. And it's because of the prayer life of the church of Philadelphia, their piety and their intimacy with Jesus because of their devotion to him that he kept them from their hour of trial. It seems like the act of corporate worship is a diet discipline. Look at what Barna Research Group said, and I quote, not only are most prayers a solo practice, but the vast majority are also most often silent, 82% compared to 13% audible and solo prayers. Affirming this shift is the fact that only a very small percentage most often pray audibly with another person or group. It's 2%. Or collectively, with a church, 2%, end of quote. The church, only 2% of the church will pray out loud with someone. Only 2% of the church will pray in church. Church is supposed to be a house of prayer. That is where prayer should be taken, 2%. Another research statistic I saw on the internet done by crossway.org was this. 70% of the people spent 10 plus minutes in prayer last week. 29% of people spent 30 plus minutes in prayer in the past week. 11% of the people spent 60 plus minutes in prayer in the last week. Can you imagine? Only 11% of the people chose the prayed more than 60 minutes in the last week selection. This could mean that they prayed just the one time and it was over. This could mean that they do that daily. But the question was in the last week. Jesus chided Peter and the other disciples in Matthew chapter 26 verse 40 for not praying with them for at least an hour. He said, Peter, you can pray with me for an hour? Here's the problem. Why we don't see more miracles, more signs, why we don't see more wonders. Because the fact that the church preaches against such things, not counting that, 
But the problem is, we don't spend the amount of time that is needed with our Lord Jesus Christ to build up the kind of faith to see signs and wonders and miracles. I want you to watch this video. Just look at this video. There was a professor at Florida State University. His name is Kay Anders Erickson. He's the originator of the 10,000 hour rule. And where that came from is he studied professional athletes, world-class musicians, chess grandmasters, all of these ultra competitive folks in ultra high performing fields. And he tried to figure out how long does it take to get to the top? of those kinds of fields. And what he found is the more deliberate practice, the more time that those individuals spent practicing the elements, of whatever it is that they do, the more time you spend, the better you get. And the folks at the tippy top of their fields put in around 10,000 hours of practice. So some would say, hey, what's that have to do with anything, Brother Kenny? The point is dedication. Therefore, if that is true, and it appears to be true, then we should be able to apply that to the church. Should we not? Yes, yes we should. Well, I want you to watch this. If Jesus trained his disciples for three and a half years, that should work out to around 10,000 hours, right? Sure. Well, let's try the math. 3.5 years times 12 equals 42 months. 42 months times 30 equals 1,260 days. 1,260 days times eight hours a day equals 10,080 hours. They became the best of the best because they were dedicated. The community were laying sick people in Peter's path just so that his shadow would pass over those sick people and his shadow passing over those sick people would heal them. Others would take aprons and handkerchiefs and while Paul is preaching, they would put it on his body and then they, after he's finished preaching, he's taking it off his body. They would take it to the sick people and those people would recover. They would take it and lay it on the demon possessed and those demons would come out. All from a handkerchief, an apron that was taken from the body of Paul. When he got saved, Paul spent three years in Arabia before he went up to Jerusalem. I want us to verify that. Galatians chapter 1, verse 18 through 22. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Caiaphas and remain with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. Paul admitted that up to three years after his conversion, he was still unknown to the church. But he told the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, that he worked harder than all of them. All those other super apostles, he worked harder. While those other apostles were working eight hour days, Paul was working nine and a half, ten hour days. So let us look at the math and how it works on Paul. Three years times 12, 36 months. 36 months times 30, 1,080 days. 1,080 days times 9.5 hours a day equals 10,260 hours. The equation works. We spend way too little time studying the Word of God, praying and listening and meditating on the Word of God and being developed by the Holy Spirit whom Jesus said would teach us all things. John chapter 14 verse 26. And for this reason, we, the church of Laodicea, have grown lukewarm neither hot nor cold. Therefore, God will spew us. He will spit us out of his mouth and remove the protective hedge that he has placed up around his bride. 
He will no longer hold back or put off the time that has been decreed for the world to go through. I would suggest you stop screaming, I'm going up, and start preparing yourself and your family to go through. For those days will come upon some like a thief in the night. Even though the signs are there, even though the fulfillment of prophecies are there, still it will surprise many because they are suspecting or expecting to be spared from what they themselves have contributed to. The lukewarmness that has brought on this tribulation in the first place. Leaving the wife of your youth for your secretary. Stealing money from the church coffers. Usurping the spotlight from Jesus. Preaching a watered down gospel. We have forsaken our first love and have cleaved to self love. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 11, Jesus prophesied that many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. What is a prophet? Someone who speaks for God or who presumes to speak for God. And many false prophets are saying that the church of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, can coexist and live in harmony and live as one with the LGBTQ community. What scripture has condemned, let no man sanctify. We welcome the LGBTQ community in our services. Yes, you're welcome to come. But if they are not transformed to the image of Christ, then they cannot be active part of the church. They cannot sing on the choir. They cannot preach from the pulpit. Get saved by the blood of Jesus, change your ways, and then participate. We are the called out ones, the blood bought, the redeemed. We are a peculiar people. We have been translated from one condition to another. That is, our minds have now been transformed to the mind of Christ. So by testing, we may discern the good and acceptable and perfect will of our God. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Which, by the way, does not include staying in your sins and performing acts that are shameful to even talk about or conforming to the passions of your former ignorance. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. I want us to look at what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, no drunkards, no robbers, no swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul lists a number of people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Among those are the sexually immoral. That means if you're living with your girlfriend, if you're living with your boyfriend, you are not saved. You need to find the Redeemer. You need to find Jesus. The adulterers, the homosexuals. But also notice, thieves. That includes the so-called high-class thieves that steals the, the wealth of the nations and take it for themselves. You're not high-class. You're a common thief, a swindler. But to the church, I want to leave you with this quote. The religion that does not change you will not save you. There must be a change. If a man is not born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verse 3. The church has so much to repent for. We say, Father, please forgive us and grant us a few more years. Have mercy on us 
and on our children like the mercy you had on Hezekiah and you gave him 15 more years. Have mercy upon us, O oh Lord. Let me ask you, are you ready for the return of Jesus? Have you cried out to Jesus to save you from your sins? Jesus is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance and gain eternal life. Are you ready for that day? It's a dark and gloomy day, a dreadful day, a day that is to be feared unless you have the blood of Jesus applied to you. If you're not ready, you can be. All you have to do is to ask him. So ask him right now, come on. Ask the Lord Jesus for grace. Let his grace be shed upon you. He shed his blood for you. Will he not give you all things? Will he not share his salvation with you? Yes, yes he will. All you have to do is to ask. And if you want to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, so you can spend eternity with him, here's what you do. Repeat this prayer after me. Father, forgive me of my sins. Strengthen me, Lord. Help me to keep your commandments. Help me to love as you love. Thank you for your salvation, Jesus. I accept it now, for it's in your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is, as usual, get yourself a Bible read your Bible, highlight your Bible, learn those Bible verses, hide it away in your heart that you might not sin against them. Find a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches, but one who believes there's a right way and a wrong way to live, one who believes in the things of God, the power of the church, the power of the Holy Spirit. Be discipled in that church, and when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing, and he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay.